We live in testing times today with growing income inequality, increasing unemployment, and plummeting growth rates. Today, Professor Arpia will be delivering a lecture on Indian economy, current scenario, and challenges. We request all of you to stay muted to our meeting. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Prashant. Uh, and it's such a pleasure to interact with uh, the young activists of Chinta Bar. I've known something about the organization. I've been associated with some of its activities. And I've been deeply impressed by the degree of social commitment. And uh, it pleases me because it comes from an institution where I studied more than 50 years ago. And it wasn't all that proactive in those days. So it's nice to see that uh, despite all apparent indicators to the contrary that the media throws up, we are making progress. Society is moving forward. More young people are concerned about society. And I think that's wonderful. These are, as you said, Krishnan said, testing times. But testing times in which the news is not always negative. We've had a magnificent victory of the peasantry of India, aided by the working class, something that even the most ardent of us would have not predicted a year ago against a highly repressive regime, braving the Delhi winter and summer and the and uh, Amit Shah's police. Uh, the farmers uh, won a magnificent victory. And uh, they could not have done it alone. They had to do it with the help of the working class. And I think that's, in a sense, uh, a portent of the days, weeks, and months, and years to come, that we see increasing unity of working people in this country as they battle the consequences. <laughs> <laughs> of uh, government policies which have been sorry <laughs> excuse me have been quite disastrous now uh, in this uh, session today i will mainly stick to the indian economy although some comments on larger issues will become unavoidable as we go along. Uh, let me first also suggest, I'll try and avoid use of economic jargon. <coughs> you must bear with me, this will go away after a couple of minutes. Uh, these are you know, times when we sneeze is a permanent feature of our lives. Uh, <laughs> and I'm, not, I'm not wearing a mask in front of my TV, of course. Um, my laptop, of course, and I'm isolated from the rest of the house, so don't worry about what I'm doing to the rest of the family. Uh, uh, a Brahminical device to keep most people in the dark. Uh, so you speak in Sanskrit instead of a language that people understand, and that's what much of mainstream economics is all about. So I intend not to use that language and intend to use plain English as far as possible. Uh, we also need some historical perspective on this issue of Indian economy. Although the title says current scenario and future challenges, even to understand the current scenario, we need something of a historical perspective on the Indian economy. Now, you are aware that uh, we became independent roughly 75 years ago. And there was great uh, expectation on the part of the Indian people when we became independent. Uh, if you take the trajectory over a very long period, you could say that basically uh, we did attempt uh, taking advantage of somewhat favorable international conditions when we became independent. We did attempt to build a relatively autonomous path of development in India. Path of capitalist development, no doubt, but it is uh, one. Uh, characterized by relative autonomy vis-a-vis -vis advanced countries. Relative, not, in, not entirely absolute, because you still depended on them for markets and finance and technology and so on. But nonetheless, you attempted some kind of economic self reliance and, uh, and you could do that because there was the socialist camp and the USSR and other countries which could be used as a bargaining culture against the 
old uh, West, you know, the imperialist Western countries. But all that changed dramatically post 1980. That path was not without its contradictions. It had its contradictions, it had its inequalities, and it's uh, a path that served uh, a handful of people far better than it served the majority of the population. Nonetheless, it had certain virtues. It built an industrial infrastructure. It built, uh, you know, human resource infrastructure. It built a financial infrastructure. Uh, all the blaming those who were in office at that time for everything that they think that they think is wrong. Uh, but post 1980, entered a new world: the growth of finance capital in the Western world uh, became a very dominant factor. And once finance capital has become very it sought to remake the world, countries uh, in a manner that suited its own interests. Therefore, countries were essentially borders that we opened up for the free flow of capital as far as finance and of course, of forced liberalization, opening up of the economies. Uh, had also had its political impact in terms of weakening the working class movement in the Western world and weakening the third world countries which had tried to assert themselves against imperialism. But most importantly, these were important in attacking the USSR and the Eastern European countries, which ultimately were unable to withstand and sustain pressure from the Western countries and, and collapsed in the late 80s, early 90s. This is not the occasion to go into why they failed and so on. There's much to be discussed there and many lessons to be learned but the consequence was quite disastrous for countries like india basically india by 1990 was facing three major negative developments one was the uh, collapse of socialism and therefore the emergence of a unipolar world led by the us and india would be increasing at the mercy of the mercy of western powers uh, in terms of economic policy options second was the uh, implementation from 1991 in our own country of a relatively uh, sustained neoliberal policy framework. And the third was the rise of right-wing uh, communal authoritarian forces, uh, which of course also was a phenomenon. The emergence of the right-wing political forces was a phenomenon again across the world, but particularly severely so in India with the Ram Mabumi dating around 1990 and the Rise of a fairly, uh, fairly aggressive and vicious uh, communal force in this country, which later found itself perfectly aligned with the corporate uh, sector. So we have today a regime of what you may call corporate Hindutva in place for quite some time, some years now. Now, this is the broad context, okay? And uh, maybe some of the terms I used may not be uh, that palatable to some of you, but these are ways of describing uh, the changing contours of the uh, social political environment within which our economic development had to take place. Now, again, uh, before I get into what is happening today, very quickly, the um, three central aspects of neoliberal policies followed since 1991 could be summarized as liberalization or deregulation. One, privatization, two, and globalization three. Let me elaborate each of these for a minute. Uh, liberalization, or, or a better term, would be deregulation, because liberalization has some nice positive connotation, but deregulation and its consequences are hardly nice, uh, positive, or anything like that for ordinary people. Uh, this liberalization or deregulation essentially meant uh, removal of all norms of social accountability on the part of the very large private players. Although the marketing of this deregulation is performed by saying, now look at the government putting so many obstacles in the way of young entrepreneurs and so on. We have to get rid of red tape and bureaucratism and all of that. Very appealing. But de facto, this is all about allowing pri large private capital to do pretty much what it wanted to do without having to be hemmed in by social regulations regarding environment or labor laws or any of those other things that capital considers to be a nuisance. The second part, privatization. Uh, was partly about what we are all familiar with, namely disinvestment, selling off of 
uh, people's assets, which are quote unquote the government owned assets at a point in time, to private entities. Uh, this is the most prominent aspect of uh, privatization that people talk about, and it's, it's a very important aspect. And I think it's something we are up against today. These are very serious consequences because if uh, private entities are buying up people's assets, then the income from those assets will go to those private entities and not to the people. As simple as that. And is that really necessary? Is a question we ought to be asking. Because now, even, even in terms of the government's own justification for this investment, it's no longer about alleged deficiency of the private sector. That argument has been uh, given up. That's quite simply, we need money. We need revenue for the government. And where do we need revenue for the government? Because we've given away so many tax concessions. And we need revenue because we don't want to have large deficits. Where are we worried about that? Because if we have large deficits, then foreigners might leave the country and won't keep the money here. So this is this whole you know, uh, set of uh, intertwined arguments that have uh, been the rationale for uh, disinvestment in recent times. Not even the earlier rationale of trying to argue that the private sector is somehow quote unquote more efficient. That is so difficult to sustain given the uh, enormous range of private sector failures, including in banking, by the way, which is now again being sought to be privatized by the government. Uh, the third element, I would, uh, but, but before I go to the third element, the more important aspect of privatization gets missed out in a lot of the discussions is that it's not just about disinvesting government assets or people's assets owned by a government of the day or controlled by the government of the day. It's also about abdicating the government's responsibility for domains considered earlier to be government's uh, in remit, education, healthcare, uh, public infrastructure. So all these now become privatized and uh, they are run on the basis of the logic of private profit maximization, uh, which essentially means that this is serious implications for the access to the ordinary people, the poor people of the country, to education, healthcare, or infrastructure. There also notions of what is infrastructure will change. International airports will be important, but not uh, roads, the countryside that take uh, farmers to their markets more easily, and so on and so forth. So uh, I don't need to elaborate. Bro, shut so, the so, fuck so, up, my nigga. Shut your Indian ass up, bitch. You look like a fucking pussy, hello. nigga. You a motherfucker. Hello. There's some interference. Yeah, sorry for that. Yeah, yeah, I don't know where it came from, but uh, could come from anywhere. We, we, have a lot of, we could also have bucks in the country, but in any event, let's so let's hope it is something else. Uh, in any event, so what we say the the privatization part had two components. One was the uh, disinvestment of people's assets. The second was the expansion of space for profit-driven economic activity into domains earlier uh, not provided, such as education, healthcare, uh, infrastructure. But perhaps the most important part of the uh, neoliberal reforms was the third part, globalization, which again had two aspects to it. One was this whole issue of trade liberalization, that is to say removal of restrictions on imports and exports of goods and services, uh, following global developments, including the emergence of the World Trade Organization and its mandates. This is one part, trade liberalization was one part. And uh, what the state liberalization did in the case of India uh, was to result in a consistently large deficit on what is called the merchandise trade account, which is quite simply the difference between the value of exports of physical goods from India and the value of imports of physical goods into India from abroad. And this has been the case that the value of imports of physical goods has been much, much larger than the value of exports of physical goods from India through all the last 30 years of neoliberal policies. This is one aspect. And this large merchandise trade deficit then immediately puts you on a defensive position and makes you seek sources of foreign exchange, which can make up for this huge deficit. A part of it comes from the net exports of services from India, which includes IT and IT enabled services most famously, but also tourism and so on. And in this, the earlier public investments made in public education, including English language education, 
have given us something of an edge in the massive expansion of IT IT enabled services export from 1990s onwards across the world. No thanks to our policies, but because of earlier regimes policy, because of earlier policies of self reliance and education, we have a large, cheap English knowing workforce which can be used by international IT majors. Uh, this is one part of the story, but the um, second element that eases our balance of payment difficulties or our forex difficulties is of course a, a much more important element, but a much less talked about element, which is the remittances into India by Indians living abroad. And this is mostly working people, not obviously not the uh, Nero Modi's and the Vijay Malia, but ordinary working people in different parts of the country who go work abroad under fairly difficult conditions and send home money for the siblings to get educated or family to get a roof over the head or whatever. So this has been a very important factor, remittance, inward remittances from abroad by Indian working people. And this includes women in nursing, men in other fields, you know, all, all of them. So uh, it's essentially a, a contribution that the poor workers of India make to our foreign exchange and doesn't get much of a recognition at all in the literature. But even after these two are taken together, that is say the uh, net exports of services and the remittances from abroad into India, both of which uh, help cover the large deficit on the merchandise trade account, we still are in deficit. Generally, we have always had a, what is called the current account deficit of the balance of payment. That's been quite large, uh, often about two, two and a half percent of GDP, sometimes even four percent, and in one year, six percent, right? 2012 13. So, what this does is to put a pressure, constant pressure on policymakers that. Some more you have to attract foreign exchange into the country in order to meet this persistent current account deficit in the balance of payment. How do you do that? You do that by attracting foreign capital as finance. So the second important feature of globalization, which is the one that the uh, that, uh, global finance capital has been most insistent upon, is the free movement, relatively unrestricted free movement of capital as finance across country borders. And this is something that has been pushed right from the uh, trade negotiations of GATT ninth round, eventually uh, reaching uh, the WTO, uh, culminating in the WTO organization being set up. So today, the uh, Western uh, you know, powers have managed to deregulate to a substantial extent cap capital flows, financial flows across country borders. And what this does for a country like India is to essentially keep them on the leash. They have always got to be worried about the impact of their economic policies, which may uh, lead to an increase in deficits. For example, welfare expenditures made under popular pressure, which might lead to uh, larger deficits and in turn also to larger balance of payment deficit. And then this would immediately lead to potential outflows of foreign capital as finance. So the fact of footloose foreign finance capital largely engaged in speculative activities in the country, in stock markets and commodity markets and so on, is something that becomes a very important factor for government to reckon with. So in a neoliberal policy framework, governments have to be worried all the time about the likely exit of foreign finance capital, which will then have a whole host of consequences for the Indian economy, including its stock markets, but also including, uh, you know, prices of imports and so on. So, because it will impact on the valuation of the Indian currency as capital exits, the rupee will decline related to a stronger hard currency like the dollar. So that's something that uh, you know we need to keep in mind. Now, these uh, this is what explains the extraordinary indulgence towards foreign finance capital that neoliberal policies demonstrate time and again. Um, so this, these three uh, components of neoliberal policies all essentially then end up uh, in one direction, namely increasing control over the economy by large private players, both domestic and foreign, and scant regard for the priorities and preferences of the mass of India working people. That's really what we've been seeing in evidence in the last now, 
before we get into what's happening today, one summary statement of these 30 years would say that concrete the claims made for it at the beginning of the whole narrative in 19, initially on, by saying we can't do anything else, we are in a crisis, so the fund and the bank have told us to do this, and later on saying this is the right thing to do, because after all, look at the world, the USSR has collapsed, there's no socialist alternative, so we might as well accept what the bank says and uh, try and, you know, fall in line with uh, the unipolar world. So that, uh, uh, at that time, the narrative also said that if we now open up the Indian economy, deregulate it, expand the space of private sector for profit maximization, have practically all activities driven by profitability considerations, and in addition, if we open up the economy to external trade as well as capital flows, then a lot of capital will flow into the economy. Domestic as well as foreign capital will have incentive to invest here and make money. Of course, the trick was that uh, this is not enough, that you know, in order to attract them to your country as against some other country, you also have to offer them tax concessions. And if you order, if you offered tax concessions for international capital, then you would of course have to offer similar concessions for domestic big capital as well. So we are on that slope of offering concession after concession to both domestic and international big capital. This is the this is the path that we've been on for 30 years with some you know ups and downs, with some uh, opposition uh, putting brakes on it, as for example in the period of uh, 2004 to 8, when the UPA Congress-led UPA government was dependent on the support of the left for survival in government. That is about the only period when there was some pushback and we could get some legislation passed and some pro-people uh, measures taken, such as the Rural Employment Guarantee Act, such as the Right to Information Act, such as the a kind of a diluted Right to Education Act, the National Food Security Act, which came a little later and it's quite diluted, but nonetheless, I know, advanced in many respects. We also had the intervention of an activist division uh, on issues of universalization of midday meals, the integrated child development services scheme, and therefore some significant uh, progress was made in the direction of food and nutrition security during that window, that short, short window of 2004 2008. But outside of that, We've had neoliberal regimes for the most part, and especially aggressive ones in 1998, 2004, and again from 2014. So the overall balance sheet is that, yes, we've had uh, growth, but the growth rates of this period uh, are not statistically significantly different from that of the decade preceding the reform. But Again, that's something I can't go into in detail. What we can say is that even this 1991-2021 is differentiated into distinct phases. And we will talk today mostly about the most recent phases, 2014-21. What we could argue is that there's some bits and pieces in this whole period where the economy did a little better, 2004-8, for example. But overall, the growth rate of the economy, if you see that as an indicator, is really not different from the pre-reform 1980s decade. But more to the point, uh, the serious concerns relate to the nature of growth, uh, what's happened to a sector that employs a significant part of India's workforce, namely the primary sector, agriculture, forestry, and fisheries, what's happened to employment and uh, working conditions and wages and earning the working people. Of course, also what's happened to other aspects of society, such as social operation, gender discrimination, violence against women and the, and the oppressed castes and tribes. All of that, of course, we can't cover in a lecture like this today. I, mean, I won't even do that. But all that is somewhere there, back of your mind. You must not lose sight of the other aspects of the last 30 years. Because one of the things that uh, a regime of neoliberal uh, policy does is to say, state shall not intervene anywhere. So you can't intervene against social oppression. You can't intervene against gender discrimination. So it requires immense popular pressure to make governments do that, to respond to that. They have been forced to respond in some respects, although they are all the time trying to push back against the popular movements. Now, this is the broad context where we come to the period today. And now we know, everybody knows that the 
almost two years of the pandemic have seen enormous suffering of the Indian people and relatively very little effort by the union government to address the suffering. In fact, the last seven years have been a period of great suffering for Indian people, uh, but particularly so the pandemic years. And uh, at the same time, I want to remind you that uh, the Indian economy was in a downward spiral already before the pandemic arrived. You go back and look at it, the first known case of uh, the coronavirus was detected in Kerala in late January, January 30th, 19, I mean, uh, uh, 2020, 19, 2020, sorry. And then the budget of the union government was being presented on the 1st of February, 2020, which had which showed no sign of having anything to do with the uh, COVID pandemic. The government of India, uh, Kerala government intervened immediately and tried to address the issue. But the government of India waited for a couple of months. These two months were the months between January 30th and uh, March 24th, if I remember right, when lockdown was enforced across the country. When, of course, Mr. Trump visited Ahmedabad, and we could showcase our Prime Minister with Mr. Trump as two of the major leaders of the world, of quote unquote free world. And then you had the um, change of government in Madhya Pradesh, which had to be organized in that interval. So, in a sense, the union government took COVID seriously only after that, uh, late March. And then when it did, there was a draconian lockdown at four hours notice across the country, undifferentiated countrywide lockdown with enormous consequences. And in a sense, that has been characteristic of union government policy on the pandemic, very highly centralized, very arbitrary, very little consultation with the states and uh, trying to impose the financial burdens of the pandemic essentially mostly on the state right down to the most recent uh, flip-flops on vaccination and earlier of course the uh, phenomenon we saw of uh, union government saying we can't give you GST compensation union government saying that uh, you have to borrow from the market, not from the RBI. So state governments would borrow at 8 9%, whereas the union government would pocket the RBI surplus and also borrow on much more favorable terms from the RBI. And the idea of allowing state governments to borrow from the RBI or for the government of India to borrow from RBI and give it to state governments never occurred, despite economists recommending it. But more to the point, in the two years of the pandemic, Perhaps the most signal failure of the union government was not putting in place a sufficiently large scale relief and rehabilitation program. The first of these was announced uh, in early April 2020, but that was announced to be 1.7 lakh crores, but on closer examination, it turned out to be more like 90,000 crores, roughly about 0.5% of the GDP, because the rest of it had already come in the budget. Uh, then the second package announced in May of 2020, uh, which was allegedly 20 lakh crores, but on closer examination, most of it was, uh, you know, having to do with lending and lending conditions and guarantees and so on. But real expenditure by the union government amounted to hardly 1% of GDP. So in all, union government's direct fiscal expenditure to stimulate the economy in the period of the pandemic uh, imposed destruction of livelihoods it was not even 2% of GDP. And that's uh, essentially the factor behind the highly dis distressed condition of the Indian economy today as we look at the position almost two years since the arrival of the pandemic. Uh, what I need to remind you also is that before we went into the pandemic, it's why I said we were in a tailspin uh, towards low growth, growth rates and towards the recession. This had to do with two major, essentially unilateral interventions by the union government, although GST was something long in process, but the final GST design was so ham handed and implementation was even more so. But the other one, exclusively the union government's responsibility and perhaps even not the union government but one person who took decision on this demonetization which occurred on the 8th of november 2016 uh, and was claimed to be aimed at eliminating uh, 
black money, fake currency, terrorism, and corruption all at one blow. Of course, you know, this is uh, was a cruel joke on the people because all the money came back to the banking system. We know all that. We, we know that there was a uh, massive, massive damage done to the informal sector of the Indian economy by demonetization. Uh, likewise, by the ham handed GST. The GST has been much discussed. Uh, the economists have the wrong way of discussing it, but I just want to highlight for the ordinary student the two points about GST which must be kept in mind. One, it is essentially indirect tax. It's on goods and services. Therefore, the impact of GST falls on ordinary people who buy mo the most basic things. It's not something that the rich pay, it's something a large part of it paid by ordinary working people in when they go out and buy essentials for their existence. Second thing is that the GST uh, devastated the state's fiscal powers. First of all, the state governments were essentially uh, destroyed at one go. Currently, state governments can only levy taxes at their own discretion on petrol, diesel, tobacco, and alcohol. All other commodity tax rates have to be decided at the GST Council. <clears throat> Whereas, you know, the government, union government holds a very strong position. Uh, in addition, of course, GST initially, the to bring somebody under the GST, the limit was made to be uh, 20 lakh rupees a year. Whereas before the GST came on, yeah. The excise duty kicked in only with an annual turnover of 1.5 crores. So many people don't notice this. Essentially, GST was a way of harassing the small trader, the small producer, the MSME entrepreneur, and all your tiny, tiny shopkeepers and grocers and so on. Can you imagine any, them trying to deal with it? Of course, you know, there have been a lot of flip flops after that. There's been some relaxation of these limits. But on the whole, this is quite a disastrous thing. And what is ironic is that in the middle of all this, the Indian government simply refused to pay GST compensation to the states, saying we don't have the money and you have to wait for it. And currently now they are celebrating sudden increase in GST collections and seeing that as an indicator, as one of the high frequency indicators uh, that suggest a rapid resumption of economic growth in India. So this is, uh, you know, the, the, the overall dismal scenario when the opposition parties and economists were saying from day one of the pandemic, they were saying this is a serious, massive loss of livelihood in the country that comes from lockdowns, which are inevitable maybe, and you have to impose them, but then they have to have some way of providing for the livelihood. And therefore, the situation was that if you take all non-IT paying households, those who are in the IT bracket, you can leave them out. They are reasonably uh, provided for. But all those non-IT paying households, suggestion that came from the opposition parties and from many economists, uh, was that you would have to provide for a certain period, a monthly cash transfer of around 7,500 rupees, which will enable these families to cope with paying rent, sending children to school, covering expenses of the ordinary kind, and, and so on. And also, enhance the allocation of free grain. After all, the uh, coffers, grain coffers are actually overflowing. The hour we had excess, lots of grain stocks with us. Uh, provide them 10 kilograms per adult per month for a period of six months. This was a demand raised almost from day one by opposition parties, including uh, in particular the left. But uh, this is something the union government never bothered to respond to. And so, you know, instead of that, it arbitrarily and then dribbles, let out some relief measures, even on such a fundamental uh, lifeline as the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. If you have seen a recent article in the Economic Times, it reminds us that as late as November 2021, the previous month that we are talking about, uh, the funds were very inadequate and as against the demand for employment, not even half the employment could be provided to desperate rural households. Half the migrants had gone up to the villages, they're there, everybody needs a job. So as it is, the MNRE scheme was a limited partial employment guarantee. It only provided for 100 days of employment per rural household 
which enrolled in the scheme. But even that was not available. In, for example, in a state like Tamil Nadu, which I think is you know much better in many respects, and in fact it is. Even in Tamil Nadu, the average date of employment uh, in MNRG is hardly 48 50 days. So you know, uh, but in many states, in the rest of the country, it's worse. And uh, during the pandemic, the Indian government refused to substantially step up allocation for MNRGF, which would have been a great thing to do because it created purchasing power, it has led to local production, and the nature of demand from the poorer sections is not import intensive. They would have been able to buy the goods made by uh, you know, the petty producers across the country. It would have been a win win uh, strategy, but the government of India would not even consider it. Uh, and you must ask why. I mean, because you know, the, in a sense, you must understand the link between the larger policy framework and the specific actions or inactions on the part of the Indian government. If you go back to the period just before the pandemic in 2019, I hope all this is uh, straightforward to you. Not, I'm not using any technical terms. If any problem, uh, in the chat box, somebody can raise your issues. But uh, let me complete my presentation and maybe we have time to look at uh, possible questions. But uh, yeah, so at the moment, uh, I'm proceeding on the understanding that you're following what I'm saying. Uh, is that okay? Yeah, I hope so. You're all, uh, you're, you're, all your audio is blocked. So anyway, I'll, I'll make the assumption. At least Krishna should have kept his audio open. Um, okay, so now if you take yes, so so I know people are hearing. <laughs> Is it okay? Not too difficult. Not too okay. Fine. Let's continue. Um, and the teacher is always anxious that you are you reaching your students or not. So you know it's an old uh, it's a habit that dies hard. Okay, now in the period just leading up to the pandemic, when this present regime came back to office in July 2019, you will recall. That very soon thereafter, they made a budget presentation in July 2019, an interim budget, which uh, basically the number was so lacking in credibility that the budget had to be discarded more or less very soon thereafter. But more to the point, the uh, captains of industry literally came to the streets later that year. And one of them said, We can't sell two wheelers, we can't sell automobiles. Another man said, We can't even sell biscuits. Okay, this is the extent of the a lack of purchasing power among the masses. Government of India did not officially acknowledge uh, a crisis of demand, but it responded by providing concessions to the, first of all, uh, to foreign finance capital, which you will understand given what I've said earlier, that namely you are always running a balance of payment deficit, so you're desperate to attract foreign exchange. Therefore, you're willing to go to any lengths to cater to the whims and fancies of speculative foreign finance capital that comes in and goes out of your stock markets and commodity markets. So they removed uh, what had been imposed in the budget, uh, surcharge on capital gains tax in the stock markets, promptly removed, and the damage to the government exchequer was about 10,000 crores, and the foreign finance capital would have been reasonably pleased with this gesture. This was followed by announcement of export subsidies worth about 50,000 crores, followed by Concessions announced for the uh, housing and real estate sector at about 20,000 crores. This was followed by the most important measure, which was a drastic reduction in the corporate tax rate to 22% flat. And by the finance minister's own uh, statement, this would lead to a loss of revenue to the government of 1.45 lakh crores. So we are talking about, about 2.25 lakh crores of tax revenue which would have been collected for a very small number of entities being simply handed over to them. And then comes the February 1st, 2020 budget, where another 65,000 crores of concessions in direct taxes is announced. So essentially with that budget, you've given away three lakh crores of people's money to a very small number of entities. These are no doubt economically much more important, but numerically, they consider a very small part of the population in terms of who benefits. And of course, there's no guarantee that these concessions would necessarily result in investments or employment. That's an assumption that has been 
fundamental to neoliberal policy framework. That if you offer concessions to the private sector, they will be excited, they will be incentivized, they will make investments. This is the narrative, 1991. Jobs will like expand, incomes will rise, poverty will disappear. We have heard this for 30 years, so we know a little better now. Uh, than what we did in 1991 as the exact implications of these policies. Nonetheless, nonetheless, in, in uh, 2019, we followed the same policies, even more aggressively. In other words, that's why I call this regime, in comparison to its predecessor regimes, ultra-neoliberal. Not even just neoliberal, but ultra-neoliberal. Of course, the other tag is corporation withdrawal, so which also fits them very well. Now, you must remember that uh, it's not just the identified cronies, but a doyen of Indian big business who anointed uh, the present regime uh, as being fit to govern the country. I mean, so these things are things that the people tend to forget uh, because some people have very, very sleek images. So you know, one should be taken in by images. One should look at the facts on the ground. Now, in the uh, run up to that uh, budget, this three lakh crore concessions came and therefore in the budget, the union finance minister said we would try to sell 2.1 lakh crore rupees worth of public sector shares in order to make up the deficit. We have to show a small deficit, otherwise we'll be in trouble, right? Of course, they couldn't get the markets to buy all this, so God, it's got postponed. But it's come back to you now, two years into the pandemic, in the form of the great and famous fire sale of Indian people's assets, uh, what does mean called by a fancy term. It's amazing the use of the language. It's called the National Asset Monetization Pipeline. That's the word they're using for it. That's the phrase. I mean, it sounds wonderful. It's like an Alauddin lamp, you know. What is this National Asset Monetization Pipeline? Give me some. But what does it really mean? It means selling your assets, basically, people's assets. They will say, no, 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 no. They'll protest saying, we're not selling. We're only giving it a long-term lease, but we know what it means. And uh, this is... Uh, Disinvestment with a vengeance. You see, if you take the history from 1991, even the earlier regime, the Mohan Narasimha Rao regime of 1991, 1996, of course, a very brief, short lived year of regime of 1998. Then the uh, Vajpayee government in its avatar of 98 and then 99 2004. That was the regime that really set the ball rolling on disinvestment on a large scale. They had a minister for disinvestment, Mr. Arun Shari, who's now on the other side of the issue, luckily. But at that time, he was all for disinvestment. And he started off the sale of the Centaur Hotel in Mumbai and so on. Um, but in the next regime that came, 2004 to 8, the UPA 1 regime, the United Progressive Alliance 1, led by the Congress, that was stymied in its bid to keep selling assets because of the uh, critical support it needed from the left to survive in office. So that's a period of relatively modest selling of public sector assets. But once the UPA-1 regime was no longer dependent on left support, it let loose disinvestment on the country in the subsequent part of its regime, 2009-14. But even that was peanuts compared to what this government has done in the last seven years. Uh, the, if I remember right, the uh, second, the UPA-2 regime, on an average, disinvested the tune of about 20,000 crores a year about 1.5 lakh crores in their entire five year term. This government was doing about 60,000 crores a year. Until of course the, the last two years came and they want to basically sell three lakh crores a year of this investment. This is what they're talking about, right? So you, know, you have a government that is a government for a short period, which feels it has a right to sell people's assets at, you know, in large value. So that's something that the country needs to debate. Is it? All right for us to allow, you know, the government of the day to sell national assets. Is that not some uh, requirement? Of course, in principle, you could say I we take it to the parliament and budget is approved. But the budget approves a general number. It says okay, X crores, X lakh crores, but it doesn't say which which factor, which company, which shares. And so we don't know the extent of corruption that occurs in these disinvestment operations. So all these are issues that I'm just throwing them out. Uh, for you know, sensitive students like you to reflect on, because we have a narrative that is fed to us in the media, which is very different from what I'm saying. You will be wondering which planet I came from, because you know, this is not what you read in the daily media. 
But uh, some of you know, of course, uh, through your own reading, that the reality is different from what the corporate control media tell us. But the, the gap is phenomenal. Enormous. You see, between truth and what we get from the corporate media in general. So what we uh, therefore have is in 2019-20 itself, prior to the pandemic, uh, huge giveaways to the corporate sector, then consequent attempts at selling assets to make up the gap between incomes and revenue, I mean, expenditure of the government. Simultaneously, you have a massive slowing down of the economy. And there are three reports or three aspects that I want to make you familiar with that to understand why the economy went into a slowdown even before the pandemic and has gotten worse after that. Uh, one, of course, is the continuing agrarian crisis. And uh, perhaps one thing we can celebrate today when we are talking about this is what I said at the beginning of my lecture, which is the magnificent victory of the peasants of India against all odds. And uh, in the most unlikely, uh, it's the most unlikely victory in a battle. Uh, but the crisis of the agrarian economy is far from over. It's been there for a long time. And it's, uh, of course, the most tragic manifestation is uh, suicides of farmers and in large numbers. But if you looked at viability, economic viability of crop cultivation, it's been negative for a significant proportion of the cultivating population. Roughly 30 to 40 percent of small and marginal farmer households have often been unable to meet their expenses. You have the most recent data from government. The, Situation Assessment Survey of Farm Households, uh, NS's report 579 and 587. One is on the debt and investment survey, the other is on the uh, Situation Assessment Survey of Farm Households. What do they tell you? They tell you, according to the SAS of agricultural households, defined in the survey to uh, include all house, rural households with uh, annual value of crop production exceeding 4,000 rupees. This is a lease out the smaller people, but even taking that definition, rural households which have a value of agricultural production exceeding 4,000 rupees in a year, this is the uh, frame. Okay, in this frame, they have done a large sample survey, and what we get is that the average monthly income is an average, mind you. A lot of people will be well below that, so I'll come to that in a second. The average monthly income of such a defined agricultural household is, if you take into account their own labor costs and own resources included, it's roughly around 8,337 per month. If you take a family of five, this is about 1,600 or 1,700 per person over a month, which if you then take divide by 30, gives you 50 rupees, 60 rupees, maybe 65 rupees a day. This is the per capita daily income of an agricultural household on the average. Now come to the point that lots of households are below the average. That the average is really, always in India, the average is really skewed, you see. The median is a better measure. So, you know, at least 60-70% uh, of the population of, of agricultural households will be below this. And uh, you can see that after all the talk of 6% plus growth rates and 1% plus growth rates and so on, you have the, the overwhelming majority of rural agrarian households practically living below the poverty line of any kind. I mean, I would say, I usually call it the non-death line. I don't call it the poverty line. The line where you can't die, you may not be able to live, but you can't die either. So that's the non-death line that we have. And that's where, you know, a large proportion of your farm households are. Now, remember that this definition excludes manual labor households, which don't get income from agriculture. And you can imagine what their positions would be like, pandemic or no pandemic, it's certainly pandemic much worse. So, you know, the completely dismal living standards of the working population in the countryside is what we have here. I mean, but you know, we nobody's talking about it. The media is not discussing it. Nobody's writing on this, except uh, Sai Nath here, uh, or Nathriya there, who's looking at these things. You know? So it's, it's, it's very, very distressing that our, our callousness and indifference to the majority of our own fellow citizens. 
Um, this is one. So the agrarian crisis continues. And it has to do with neoliberal policies. Why do neoliberal policies impact negatively on agriculture? Because they withdraw support to agriculture. That was there earlier. They cut back subsidies. They don't uh, guarantee minimum support prices. They remove access to institutional credit. They uh, allow imports of agricultural produce, which drives down the prices of output of farmers. So input costs go up. You just look at what's been happening to diesel and petrol and imagine what it means for the farming households. So input costs rise, output prices fall, infrastructure collapses, extension services, national farm research services, um, irrigation, storage spaces for farmers, roads in the countryside for farmers to go to the market, all of these deteriorate, okay? So you know, here is a sector which is, unlike industry, crucially dependent on nature and therefore subject to far greater volatility. And this is a sector that gets practically no support. So this is neoliberalism for you. Withdrawal of support to agriculture, which you know, it, it still accounts for the livelihood of a substantial share of the Indian population. And so this is one thing. This is one part of the story. Second story is employment, unemployment. Again, you know, here one of the things you should remember always is that in India, it is not possible to be unemployed for long because nobody is going to feed you. There is no social security system, right? So what do you have? You have uh, enormous uh, you know, make work kinds of occupations that people are engaged in. Even the much wanted uh, services sector is not all, you know, IT, IT enabled services, banking and insurance. It is a lot, lot of the service sector employment with low productivity, make work employment, where people come to you and offer to shine your shoes, sing you songs in the train, or sell flowers at the bus stand. This is your service sector. Petty grocers, small artisans. So this is this service sector employment this is, is glorified. I mean, all self-employment in India is at very low levels of income. And so, you know, you have this uh, situation where you can't afford to be unemployed, but there is no employment. So we have this you know, five-year data from large national sample survey data on unemployment rates over a very long period, 1978 onwards, for the first time, in 2018-19, uh, the results of a survey, 17-18, sorry, the results of a survey that this government didn't want released until the elections of 2019 were over. This is the National Employment and Employment Report. What has now come to be called the Periodic Labor Force Survey, what used to be called the NSS Survey of Employment and Employment, that threw up a result for 2017-18 that the, what is called the usual state of unemployment rate, and somebody unemployed throughout the year, had risen threefold from 2% to 6%. That's a huge number to be unemployed throughout the year. Who's going to feed you, right? The second, the same survey told you that the current weekly status of unemployment, that is if you take the last seven days and you go and interview a respondent, take the last seven days, cut it into 14 and a half days. And if the respondent has worked at least one hour on any one of the half days, you count that person as employed. Though it's as low an unemployment figure as you can arrive at, okay? And yet you find this unemployment rate grew from 6% to 9%. For the educated, the unemployment rate became 18%. For those uh, in the youth age group, uh, 15 to 29, the unemployment rate is again about close to 1 6 Surveys and you, if you take uh, the 2011-12 uh, and 2017-18 NSS and for expenditure surveys, it's very interesting. You know, this is a period 11-12 to 17-18. If you had read the newspapers and the economic surveys, you would have seen growth rates being reported of seven percent, eight percent. In fact, the irony is, you know, the year of demonetization, the government of India's mandarins had the gall to claim a growth rate of 8%. I was absolutely shocked. Of course, the same guys who wrote those reports when they went out, they said, oh, you know, the Indian GDP is overestimated. 
was reduced by at least two percentage points. They're all distinguished professors of economics. I shall not name names, but when they went out, they suddenly, you know, got closer to reality and said the rates are actually about more like four percent, more like five percent, cut down two percentage points from whatever we said earlier. Oh, I didn't write that. Somebody else must have written it, right? And, and of course, but we have a joker now who actually believes what he says. He's sitting in the finance ministry and you know, making fantastic claims. Again, no names will be mentioned, but uh, as a matter of courtesy, but ridiculous. And so, you know, you have a uh, question to ask is if you had seven, eight percent growth rates from 2011 12 to 17 18, how come the NSS data show? that rural monthly per capita household consumer expenditure actually fell in absolute terms by over 9%. It didn't grow more slowly, it just fell absolutely by 9% plus over the same period when you're saying you're having six, seven, eight percent growth rates. And the urban monthly per capita consumer expenditure average didn't do great either, it improved by 2.2% which suggests that the top decides would have done better, but most of the bottom decides would have had a decline in purchasing power. So this is a very dramatic survey result, which is of course not recognized in the WDA because they say, oh, the survey was all wrong, badly done. We are not accepting it. Sounds familiar, but anyway, there you are. So what it says is that, uh, what this survey tells us is that in both urban and rural India, between 2011, 12, and 17, 18, there was a massive decline in purchasing power on the part of ordinary people. And this explains your recession in 2000. You don't have to look very far. Where you put yourself five rupee pack and biscuit? The people don't have money, right? They don't have enough money. They, they may have employment, but the wages are so low, or the returns to cultivation are so low that they can't spend. And this is the reality of India, not the shining India that Atal Bihari Vajpayee talked about in 2004 and the people didn't buy it basically, and nor the, you know, I, what is the term that the present leader uses, I don't know, the world's greatest democracy. I mean, this is a mockery after violating all democratic, <laughs> you know, <laughs> processes. Anyway, that's, uh, let me not get to the politics of this, but just to highlight these three elements, an agrarian crisis, a massive unemployment problem, and a sharp declining purchasing power. How could you expect anything except a recession? And yet we were in denial and then the pandemic came. Now we want to say everything is because of the pandemic. You know, the regime was doing great, but the pandemic spoiled it all. Obviously not. Pandemic was badly handled by the regime. We heard the regime testify in courts that nobody had of oxygen shortage. I mean, I, I mean, the list is endless, you know, I don't think if I get to that, I'll get uh, distracted. But let me just say that uh, the current scenario is dismal and is the outcome of policies of at least the last several years on top of neoliberal policies since 1991, but particularly this ultra neoliberal and erratic regime of completely ridiculous demonetization, pulling out 86% of the country's money supply. And then a completely ham-handed GST celebrated by convening the parliament at midnight on June 30, 2017. And this is a farce. This is actually doing violence to the memory of our freedom fighters. But anyway, there we are. This is, this is the kind of uh, dispensation we have. And today, uh, government is actually, you know, government spokesmen have been saying, oh, look at the results for the second quarter. 8.4% growth rate year on year. So we are out of the woods and we are recovering and we will be the fastest growing economy in the uh, world this year. I had actually put up uh, two pages of the executive summary from the monthly economic report of the Union Ministry of Finance, Department of Economic Affairs on my Facebook page. And, uh, you know, no offense intended to the persons who have written those <laughs> two pages, but quite absurd. I mean, by any stretch of imagination, uh, quite absurd. And uh, currently the government continues to make the claim that we are uh, recovering very rapidly. In fact, as uh, Raghunam Rajan said in a recent interview, your fall is very steep. Any recovery is bound to look like a V-shaped recovery. <laughs> that's, that's what it always implies. But on the other hand, even a relatively friendly source, like the Center for Monitoring Indian Economy, CMIE, 
says that despite this 8.4 percent growth rate in the second quarter of this year year on year over last years uh, they're not convinced that the recovery is in place because why because consumer expenditure is not recovering uh, so given the consumer by the way if you take the co components of national income those of you who are not economists the economy generally talk about private consumption expenditure private investment expenditure government expenditure and the demand of the rest of the world for your goods and services which is exports net export exports minus imports these are the four components of aggregate demand in the economy c for consumption i for private investment g for government expenditure and uh, x for net exports so c plus i plus g plus x is supposed to be the uh, aggregate demand in the economy now uh, what many commentators say including cmi is that c is not moving c constitutes in india about 55 percent of gdp and the consumer expenditure is not recovering people are not spending on goods and services despite relaxations in lockdown and some resumption of economic activity here and there and this is before omicron right now if that is happening then you know the 8.4 percent uh, year on year uh, growth rate recovery in GDP cannot be uh, taken to imply that the uh, period ahead is going to be recovery. We are still very uncertain about recovery, right? And so they give the example of uh, consumption expenditure. They also give the example of government expenditure, which has been very abysmally low, hasn't risen. What we would have expected is the government would have stepped up expenditure to increase demand. I mean, people. Nobel laureates who by no stretch of imagination can be accused of being left economists, people like Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo, or even Arjun Subramanian and Raghunam Rajan, they were all saying, put money in the hands of the people, give them money, let them spend. No, we won't do all that. We are, you know, we, we are holy people, we don't do such evil things. And so, you, do, you know, you had a government which is completely unwilling to spend money terrified of the fiscal deficit and what it might mean in terms of foreign finance capital or alternatively completely sold on selling the country to big capital domestic and foreign i mean it's, it's a difficult uh, you know guess to make because currently also you're talking about privatizing banks and uh, that's very interesting because you actually handed over in the name of the insolvency and bankruptcy code and settlement of dues by large corporate entities to the banking system, you actually had haircuts on the public sector banks uh, and the other banks, which is worth about 10.75 lakh crores. You actually handed over, you, you see written off the debt of large corporate players. And now you want to hand over the banks to them. It's extraordinary. I mean, this doesn't happen in any other country, but we have a very peaceful discussion of why banks should be privatized and who would buy them? Same guys who didn't pay your loan. They pay your loan, right? So, you know, or maybe other guys in their clan who buy it and so on. So, but this is very, very, very serious situation we are in because if we then, in terms of the future, challenges ahead of us, if we allow privatization of banking, if we allow the national asset monetization pipeline to succeed in selling off people's assets, then we are entering very dangerous territory. Someone like Joseph Stiglitz, an Nobel Prize winner, who is certainly again no left economist, uh, said on many occasions he was in India and I've had uh, chances to interact with him, said one thing repeatedly, he said, never allow foreign control over your banks and never privatize banks. But now we have people who you know, are determined on privatization of banks without providing any logic for doing so. So, you know, in terms of challenges ahead, we're going to have to fight the aggressive privatization drive of the present government. We're going to have to fight uh, for uh, minimum support prices as a legal guarantee for the peasantry. We have to ensure the repeal of the Electricity Act, even there are existing demand. And uh, more than anything else, we need to fight for reversal of neoliberal policies so that the earlier kind of support that agriculture got get restored in terms of uh, public investment in infrastructure of agriculture, which is what markets, uh, storage facilities, 
irrigation expansion, strengthening of the national research system, strengthening of the national extension system, and strengthening of institutional credit facilities at the very minimum. But of course, on top of that, uh, minimum support prices. Because you know, anybody who has been on the ground in even in a relatively progressive state like Tamil Nadu would know that uh, Paddy, which is you know officially has a procurement price and is a relatively safer crop for farmers to grow. Even in Paddy, most farmers don't get the procurement price because they are not in a position to take the produce to the market some distance away. Uh, so you know, this the fact that they don't take it to the market is then turned around to argue that nobody is using the facility, so why offer MSP? Leave it to private sector. So this is a very perverse argument. So we need to highlight the fact. Um, Mr. Chairman, how much time do I have? Krish, how much time do I have? How long have I taken? One second, sir. I'll, I'll get back. Ashwin, okay. could you respond? Yeah, so like we can go on till 8, eight 10 or so. Yeah. If you get hungry, yeah, I get hungry. What time is it? Don't say 8 10. Oh, it's 7.44. Don't tell me I will speak another half minute. I think you lose your audience. <laughs> anyway, let's see. Okay. So, um, essentially, this um, situation ahead of us, very challenging for those of us who believe in a self reliant uh, India which uh, does fare by its working people. That's the kind of Indian economy that I'd like to see. Uh, we have to, you know, work with the world economy. We have to have, you know, the corporate sector has to continue to play an important role in the economy. Nobody's saying get away with it, do away with it. No, but uh, we need to have incentive structures uh, revised. We need to look at neoliberal policy frameworks and discard much of their baggage. Uh, we need to restore rates of taxation on the corporate sector, which are reasonable. We need a transformation of fiscal policy much greater reliance on direct taxation and much less reliance on indirect taxation. We also need a very important structural change in the coming period, which is uh, what we have seen in the last seven years has been humongous centralization of economic policy and of finances. State governments are seriously cash strapped now. They, uh, you know, I'm, I'm amazed how Kerala manages. This is basically state governments have been starved of funds by the Indian government, and uh, the papers give hardly any space for that. Uh, we need to fight for a restructuring of central state financial relations, which uh, provides much greater resources to the states. Uh, remember, India states are not accidental entities. Each of India's states is by and large a culturally homogeneous uh, territory in terms of language and nationality. And uh, what would make India strong is that these nationalities are voluntarily in a union. That's why India's constitution calls it the union of states, as opposed to the states uh, serving at the mercy of the union of India. So the union of India must become strong only by the strength of the states, which means that the acts of centralization that have occurred in the economy and related fields, for example, education, which is brought to the concurrent list surreptitiously during the emergency, but is now being treated practically as a union list by the present government, where they impose a new education policy in the middle of a pandemic across the country. They write, likewise, they make an environment uh, order across the country in the period of uh, pandemic hoping that there will be no popular opposition. Of course, they were wrong on all these counts. There was popular opposition. Like, like they thought that the labor laws and the form laws would have no popular opposition because we are in the pandemic period. So one of the consequences of the pandemic that we need to discuss is the enormous uh, hurry with which the Indian government has sought to pass legislation that are far reaching kind. And we need to restore a democratic process of decision making in the economy. Uh, apart from this question, I raised just of more devolution of resources to the states. You see, many people don't catch this. When the union government provides the concession in corporate taxation rates, like this 22% that uh, the finance minister announced in 
2019, and the resulting loss of 1.45 lakh crores that she also mentioned. Remember, it is not the union government that loses 1.45 lakh crores. It will lose some. It will certainly lose some. But the proceeds of corporate taxation, corporate tax revenue, is part of the divisible pool between the union and the states. So states lose out heavily when the center takes a unilateral decision to reduce the corporate taxes. Likewise, when the union government chooses to hike fuel prices when global prices are declining, and does so by not so much increasing basic excess duty, which is bad enough, but it does so even more surreptitiously by raising cess and surcharges. These latter are not shareable with the states. So you attack the state's financial, uh, you know, space in this manner as well. So there are issues that I have not discussed today at length, but these are all issues also which are important to the economy. So if you want to see a vibrant uh, Indian economy with states growing at respectable speed, they have to be given more fiscal space. There has to be restructuring the central sector relations. And then of course, you know, for me, the devolution then must go below the state to the uh, sub-state level, to the third tier of government, as in fact, Kerala has shown, and many other states are very reluctant to uh, devolve powers below the state government level. Uh, and so is this, by the way, so is the civil service bureaucracy. They they generally are trained to think that people don't know anything. So what will the panchayat president do? I mean, I know better than him how to build a culvert, right? So <laughs> this whole thing, how the village needs a health center or not. So we, we have a very huge, I mean, as democratically minded person, we should also be, we talk about the economy, it can't just be a Chinese wall separating economy from the polity or from democracy and society. We have to think in terms of a democratic transition. It was greater devolution of powers to state governments and to elected local bodies. We need to rethink the tax structure, as I said, reduce the reliance. I don't know how many of you are aware when we take the total. By the way, you can actually easily find this out. There is a annual publication called the Indian Public Finance Statistics. Just Google it. Is that you don't even need to know URL these days? The Ministry of Finance publication and it is data of 1951 for state government tax revenue and central government tax revenue and gives you in some neat tables share of total tax revenue broken up into direct taxes, indirect taxes, and you will be uh, perhaps not surprised by now after hearing me for all of about an hour to know that uh, two thirds of the total tax revenue of the Union of India and the state governments put together comes from indirect taxes, taxes on goods and services that people buy and use. So it hurts the poor inordinately. It hurts working people inordinately. Uh, only one third comes from direct taxes on corporate income and personal income. We are one country which does not have a wealth tax, does not have an inheritance tax. We're an incredible country. Incredible India, right? So that's not the, that's a slogan. So when Thomas Piketty and his team from the World Inequality Lab find that India is hugely unequal, why am I not surprised? Well, I'm not surprised. You expected it. So you know, for example, Piketty gives you figures in that in that World Inequality book. All of you must have seen it on uh, you know some videos have been there. That as of 1991. Even at the start of the reforms, India was pretty unequal. Right? They never claimed that 1950 to 90 was some glorious socialist uh, decade. No, that is the uh, Arun Subramanian thinks that is socialism. <laughs> Certainly not socialism. 1950 to 90 also was a period of capitalist development, gross inequality, especially huge inequalities in landed property. And uh, this, this land monopoly was something that the ruling classes never tackled because they were an alliance, capitalists and the land war. So you come to cut to 1991, you have about the top 10% accounting for 36% of income. So they say, I don't know where they got the figure from because we don't have income data, we have expenditure data. We have income data from more recent periods from relatively less reliable sources. But that figure now becomes 57% in 2021. This is just income uh, inequality. But you must always remember that wealth inequality is the highest. Then income inequality is somewhat lower because not all the wealth gets productively used to generate income. So some of the wealth does not generate income. Therefore, wealth inequality 
is higher than uh, income inequality, which in turn is higher than consumption inequality, because some of the poor in order to survive borrow and spend. So there is a whole or a run down their assets and survive. So these are th in India we have data actually only for consumption inequality. And on that basis, we've been making all kinds of silly claims that you know we are less unequal than China. This is rubbish. We are a highly unequal society. Not that China is equal, but we are a highly unequal society. And in the last seven years, there's been much greater uh, you know, concentration of wealth in the hands of a few. And this is something that is a challenge that we have to address as a nation. And why should we address it as a nation? Sometimes people say. I think why are you bothered about inequality? As long as everybody gets food and shelter and everything, what's your problem? What they don't realize is that very huge inequality in wealth implies a fundamental erosion of democracy in a country. So people with huge amounts of wealth can essentially buy governments. And we know they can buy governments, right? I mean, these days, you know, state government elections, state elections are not even an issue for the ruling party. They say, hey, whatever results they throw up, we can buy the guys afterwards, you know? We've been doing it state after state, so what's the big problem? So we even need EVM. If anybody win, they will buy them afterwards. So you know, so obviously, extreme concentration of wealth is a fundamentally negative aspect of any democracy. Not just a question of giving people enough to eat and have shelter, and well, that, all that is good. I mean, I'm not saying don't give it all that, but don't think that inequality does not matter. Inequality matters politically, economically, and socially. And I think, you know, we come from a highly hierarchical society. We should know more than anybody else anywhere in the world what inequality means to people's lives. You come from IIT. And you know what IIT situation is like. We've been talking about it. I mean, you know, my own institution, my own alma mater, also plays where I taught. But facts are stubborn. And IITs have not discharged the responsibility to eliminate social oppression and promote social equality. That's a sad fact that we are confronted. I don't want to name names, but this is something all of us together have to address, including the ones who are in decision-making power, you know, position. They have to address this seriously and recognize its value and, and, and not make the identification of marks on an exam with merit. About mostly and that's something that uh, should inform that is one of the challenges we have challenges we have are many I mean, I, uh, although Ashwin said I could speak for another half an hour I don't think I want to test your patience but at the very minimum reversal of neoliberal policies a mode of you know, taxation policy that enhances direct taxes and lowers indirect taxes changes in uh, center state financial relations that provide much greater resources to the states who in turn should devolve more resources to the local bodies, elected local bodies, so that we have more popular participation in economic and political activity in the country. Uh, also, the people can be watchdogs over how money is spent. Um, and many other things, you know, many other, I mean, maybe I'm asking for the moon, but certainly, uh, most importantly, since I believe this to be the key, strong regulations on the inflow and outflow of capitalist finance into another country. Capital account controls are very important. Uh, they are essential if we are not to be at the mercy of uh, a bunch of global speculators. Uh, we need to run our own policies. We need, likewise, we need a reversal of the trade liberalization policies that have hurt us very badly. So we need to move towards a much more self-reliant model of the economy. It's possible. We're a very big country. We have an enough of a domestic market to make production for the domestic market viable. But that requires a redistribution of purchasing power inside the country. And so the logic of that leads you then to the next important reform, which most of you perhaps will not see the need for, but I do, which is fundamental comprehensive land reform that empowers the rural poor and enables them to spend more and uh, produce more and you know involves their enthusiasm in expanding production. And in the process, such comprehensive land reform will also address the issue of caste oppression. Because today the 
cost of production is linked with the denial of access to land and other productive assets. It's linked to occupational segmentation. So caste in India, which involves endogamy, which involves uh, you know, restricted access to different occupations, which involves denial of access to assets, this is part of the production relations of the Indian society. Caste is not something hanging up there as a mere ideological practice. It is part of the basic structure of, a, of India's society. And, and that, that's why it is part of class struggle to address caste oppression. They're not, they're not separate, unrelated entities. I mean, the fight against uh, ideologies which support and reinforce caste hierarchies, such as Brahminism, that is was very important. But Brahminism doesn't fall from the heavens. Nor does it come from the uh, you know DNA of some individuals. This is a ideological phenomenon that seeks to reproduce caste hierarchy through a whole set of material practices. So struggle against self must go on. But never forget that access to productive assets and access to all occupations are essential for a democratic India, and that's really uh, one of the most important aspects of fighting caste oppression and treating caste as a part of the production relations of the Indian economy. So if you want a progressive social transformation, that has to be very much part of your agenda. So I mean, on this note, I think, uh, I know that I have not been comprehensive. It's not possible. You must give me a semester, then I can take you to a good course in Indian economy. <laughs> if you still want, Sumasani is there, I don't know, my old friend, student Sumasani, but if she is, she knows that she's been through that. So maybe it's not Sumasani that I know. Anyway, I'll stop there, I think. And uh, if you have some space for uh, responses and questions, I'll be happy to take them on. Yes, Krishna. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the engaging discussion. So, as a person who studies, uh, who's trying to study uh, the growth effects of financial linkages, I found it very engaging. And, uh, I wanted to know when we talk about agriculture, why are we not talking about maybe manufacturing also? Talk about? Manufacturing also. Maybe manufacturing. Yeah, no, no, no. Exactly. I mean, you know, in fact, India's uh, track record in manufacturing has not been outstanding either. In fact, at the moment, uh, the share of manufacturing in India's GDP is hardly 16%, 15, 14, 15%, 16%, which is a real contrast with China, for example. And industry as a whole is about 25%. That includes uh, mining and quarrying, and it's very small. And then electricity, uh, transport, water supply, but uh, drinking water, yeah, right. Um, we should talk about what I was saying, but you know, in terms of the share of employment of the labor force, agriculture is still a significant employer. And because the crisis has been so evident in agriculture and has been part of the political debate, and of course, we have just had a very heroic struggle by the peasantry. Uh, in today's lecture, agriculture clearly became much more prominent. It's not so much about agriculture, agriculture, yes, but also farmers and agricultural laborers. In fact, the section of the rural population that does not get enough attention in policy making is the class of rural manual laborers. Uh, today, you won't find an exclusively agricultural laboring population. Population that engages in wage labor in agriculture traditionally may have been fully engaged in wage labor or unfree labor in agriculture. Today, rural wage labor is what I like to call pluriactive. It is in different uh, occupations. Uh, it's, uh, it's a head load worker one day, it's a uh, uh, you know, uh, communications worker the next day, it's uh, agricultural labor the other day. So, we have a very large manual labor force in the countryside. Right? Manual work, it's really hard work. And very often in all these discussions of poverty, we are only looking at incomes. We are not asking the question, how much effort does the family put in to get whatever it does? If you ask that question, then you know that the manual labor households are the most unjustly treated segment of the population. They work the hardest and they get the lowest incomes. So, you know, when people say, for example, that the, like, for example, in wealth inequality discussion, they say, top 1% earned so much. And I say, no, I put up my hand and say, the top 1% received so much. The bottom 50% earned so much. There's a distinction between receiving and earning. 
And so, you know, this whole fact that we have to work to earn a living is something that we very comfortably lose sight of. So, uh, uh, Krishna has to say at the moment, manufacturing is in a better position to take care of it than agriculture. But yes, manufacturing would have to be discussed. But, you know, you have an Atman Nirbar uh, dialogue, which actually makes impossible any kind of self reliance. So, manufacturing will come into its own if we have a policy of reliance on uh, science and technology and domestic markets and domestic market led growth. After all, in the first three decades after independence, uh, the three main drivers of growth were public sector investments, import substitution, and land reforms. Now, all three are out the window now. So you are completely dependent on the whims and fancies of global uh, capital, both FDI and speculative finance capital. So, yeah. So your point is well taken. I didn't focus on manufacturing today. Very aggregative talk. One semester. <laughs> yeah. Other questions, please. We can we can have a. A continuing series, if you like, uh, over a period of time, for those of you who are interested. But in one lecture, there's only so much one can do. So please ask any, any other questions that you may have. Otherwise, we'll meet again. That may be the best thing to do. I don't see, I don't see any questions on the chat box either. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your time. Thank you, all of you, for your participation. Yeah, OK. Can I exit now? Yes. Uh, so there's a message oh. in the group, in the chat. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's from Sumasini. Ah, my old student is Sumasini. How lovely. <laughs> she was a Sumasini here. I admit you see her. Excellent student of mine. And it's a delight to see her on the screen. So I must thank uh, Chintabar for letting me uh, get in touch with Sumasini again. <laughs> She's a student from you know, BIM, Biological Management, and doing very well in industry. Yes. Oh, thanks for allowing me to unmute now. Okay, thanks <laughs> to the. It has been great listening to you, sir. I found this uh, invite. No, I didn't set this up. I did not set this up. <laughs> so, Vasini, you are my young old student. <laughs> Agreed, sir. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank Thanks you. for the Thank organizers. You. Okay. It's been a great uh, pleasure listening to you. Touch with them. Chintabha is a great organization. You should be in touch with them. Absolutely, okay. sir. Absolutely. Okay. We'll do it. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. See you. Bye. 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 Bye.